So this over here is the fastest CPU in the world. In fact, Intel calls it the fastest gaming CPU in the world. But if you're a creative professional, you might be wondering, is it worth for creators? And how big is the performance gain between the 12900K compared to the 12900K? S. Well, in this video, we're going to find out what's the performance difference between those two and if the 12900KS is worth buying for creators. Looking for a cheap way to license your Windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. So these two little guys are very, very similar on the paper. So let's have a look what's the actual difference in terms of specs then. So both of them are 16 core, 24 threads. The 12900KS in max turbo frequency can actually boost in single core performance, not all core boost, but just single core boost, 5.5 gigahertz compared to the 5.2 on the 12900K. The E core max turbo frequency again code to four gigahertz and that's all core. I can see all core being pulled four gigahertz so that's no problem there. The base frequency is lifted as well from uh, 3.2 to 3.4 gigahertz and the E calls from 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. The cache is the same. The TDP is actually now 150 watts compared to 125 watts, but the turbo power is still 241 watts. You'll see in a moment, that's a very, very optimistic view. The iGPU is exactly the same. In terms of the price, the 12900KS is about $150 more expensive at $750. Now, depending where you're watching this from and what's the latest pricing, if you wanna know the latest pricing, I'm gonna leave the links in the description below where you can find the latest pricing. So to test these two CPUs, I've got a test bench set up, which is this one over here. So this is the Z690 Pro I built from ASUS that we did uh, earlier on this year. This has been the test bench set up for all of the 12th gen CPUs. So what we're running over there is the ASUS Z690 Pro Wide Creator motherboard. The cooler is the Fantex Glacier 1 360mm AIO. For RAM we're using 4 times 16 gigabytes Kingston Fury Beast and running it at 4800 MHz CL38. The GPU is the ASUS TUF RTX 1390. The OS SSD is Team Group Cardia C440. The project and the benchmark drive is the Fire CUDA 530 from Seagate and the power supply is the ASUS ROG Thor 1200 watt power supply. So then before the benchmarks, let's have a look at the power consumption. How do these two CPUs perform? Now, the max power draw of the 12900K with that system, I can see roughly about 221 watts being pulled on this particular motherboard. Nothing is overclocked. This is literally only the X and B is enabled in BIOS. Everything else is just left default, whatever comes with the motherboard, which I think most creators are gonna do when purchasing this motherboard. The 12900KS though, on the other hand, pulls 295 watts from the socket. That's about 33% more. But I have actually tested the 12900KS also on the MSI Z690 godlike motherboard. If you haven't seen that build yet, it's on the channel, go check it out. But basically, in that system, I saw 327 watts being pulled from the socket or being pushed through that CPU. Now that's the same, absolutely standard, no overclock, nothing, just let the motherboard figure out what you know, kind of power can it push through. So the 12900KS is quite the hot fella. It's roughly in the 90s. Now it's not much different from the earlier BIOS versions of the 12900K, but the later versions of BIOS where it actually pulls only 221 watts. I'm seeing actually the 12900KS run in, uh, in the 80s, whereas the 12900KS is now easily in the 90s. Depending on your cooler and your ambient temperature, you could easily see like 95 to 100 degrees on this CPU. And it's nothing to do with the cooling. You can put liquid cooling there as well. It's just going to run that hot. So then let's have a look at the benchmark. Cinebench R23. We can see that the single core performance on the 12900KS is 7.4% faster than the 12900K. Now that's quite a bit faster. And this is the fastest single core performance in the 
well of this CPU. I have not seen any other CPU run past 2000 in the single core scores. The 12900K was the only one who reached like 2004, 5, something like that. But now the 12900KS is 2140. Eight. In terms of the multi-core score, we're 5.6% faster than the 12900K. In Geekbench 5, the single core is 7.1% faster and the multi-core score is about 8% faster. In terms of the Geekbench GPU or the iGPU performance, just curious if that's going to be improved anyway in the 12900KS. Obviously not because they're all running the same frequency inside there. So the 12900KS was 0.9% or 0.88% faster in the Vulcan scores and 0.11% faster in the open seal scores but they are within 1% of each other so I don't really think they're any better of each other. So basically what matters more is what frequency your DDR5 is going to run, run at, whether it's 4800 megahertz, 5200 megahertz, because that is actually going to be the iGPU kind of, uh, you know, RAM as well or VRAM. So it's going to use the RAM. So that's going to actually determine the score of the iGPU, whether your RAM is going to run faster or slower. So this is 4800 megahertz. In terms of Blender, the monster scene is 5.7% faster in the 12900KS. The Junk Shop is 7.1% faster and the Glassroom scene is 4% faster in the 12900KS. Moving on to Photoshop, the overall score is about 3% faster in the 12900KS. But what doesn't make sense to me is the GPU score. The GPU score is about 14.2% slower on the 12900KS, which makes absolutely no sense to me because both of these CPUs run the same RTX 1390 TUF from ASUS with the latest drivers, exactly the same system, but for some reason the 12900K was faster in the GPU performance. Makes no sense to me. But generally you can expect the 12900KS to be a few percent faster in Photoshop performance. In Lightroom Classic the KS is 3.1% faster in the overall score. But interestingly, the passive score is where we're actually gaining really the performance here. Passive score is the multi-core performance where you're exporting the photos or putting them together as, you know, panorama or merging the photos where, you know, you can do like big rendering kind of uh, tasks. So that's the passive scores. That's where we're gaining this, not in the single core performance, which was actually in synthetic benchmark 7% faster. As you can see, the active score is literally the same in there, like 0.09% of each other, which is interesting. I would have expected it to be the other way. In Adobe Premiere Pro, we can see that the extended overall score is 1.7% faster in the KS and the standard overall score is a 3. 1% faster. So generally a few percent faster here and there. The standard live playback speed is a little bit faster on the KS as well, which is interesting. But most of the performance seems to be like from the uh, export score and the FX score where the KS has just better, you know, multi-core performance and single core performance. In After Effects, the overall score is 4.8. 1% faster but interestingly the actual multi-core RAM preview and render are much faster than the overall score so about 7% in multi-core scores 8.5% in the RAM preview and the render scores 8.8% which is probably one of the most difference I've seen between these two CPUs about 8.8% faster in the render uh, benchmark. Moving on to DaVinci Resolve we're about 0.8% 8% faster than the 12900K in the extended overall score, but the standard overall score is actually 3.4% faster. In V-Ray, the 12900K S is 9.2% faster. So in conclusion here we can see that yes the 12900KS is actually the faster CPU than the 12900K. In fact it is the fastest I have tested. Now it scores right on top of the benchmarks on all of the photo and video editing applications. So if you are wondering what is the best video editing CPU in the world then the 12900KS is the one. It is just the fastest, it scores right on the top of all of the benchmarks. In fact, it scores faster than even the Threadripper CPUs. So if you are doing video editing purely and you don't need the PCIe lanes, then even this 12900KS at much cheaper cost than the Threadripper systems is a better 
pick at this point in time. If you do want to see the video of like this PC compared to like a $19,000 PC with an insane build we did recently, then let me know in the comment section below. It would be interesting to see. I have the benchmarks of all of the $19,000 PC, but I haven't put them head to head. But if you're just wondering, let me know in the comment section below if you're interested in that. The big downside for this 12900KS is the power consumption in terms of the like full on utilization. But I do want to mention that this is slightly overrated in the world as well, because I don't think most of the creatives who get this CPU are going to use this for 3D rendering or something like that. If you're using it for that only, you know, maybe you have a different system that does the rendering or you're doing the rendering on the actual GPU. But generally, if you're doing photo video editing applications or workflow, you're not going to be utilizing this 100% of the time all the time, which means that actually the general and average efficiency of this is going to be very, 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 very good. What I mean by that is that the actual like idle and like mediocre usage of this CPU is much more efficient than even the Ryzen 9 5950X because most likely the cache of the Ryzen is higher, which makes that the idle CPU uh, power wattage is much higher as well. But this one can idle like even lower than the 12900 k i've seen this one idle like between 5 to 10 watts which is absolutely ridiculous it's like the light bulb it's just because of the efficiency cause and because this is so well bent it's like the highest silicon you can get really for the 12900k so on one hand yes it does pull a lot of power and run a little bit hot but on the other hand you don't really need to worry about that if you configure your you know pc correctly i would like let the fans of the actual you know aio max out like somewhere where they're not like so audible so kind of the noise isn't that much because even if they run like 100% of the speed they're not going to cool the CPU down that much faster just because the liquid is still like cooled down and the liquid is still lower temperatures it's just because the chip is so hot in such a small kind of area which means it's very hard to pull the heat out. It's much easier to actually cool the 280 watt Threadripper that has a massive die. You can put a like a heatsink Noctua on there and it's cooled down. But this one, it's such a smaller die and there's so much power run through there, it's harder to cool. So if you're wondering which cooler should you get for this, I wouldn't go anything lower than a 360 millimeter AIO. If you do want something for the good budget, I'm going to recommend the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 millimeter AIO or 420 millimeter AIO if your case allows that. It's very, very affordable. Check out the links in the description below. But if you're really not on the budget, there's all of these AC Tech coolers, very similar like from ASUS. We have the Rugin from MSI. We have the Core Liquid S. Or from Fantex, we have this Glacier one. They're all basically the same cooler, roughly around the same price range, just a little bit of different design, but all the pumps and everything else is the same. So feel free to check that out. But this one here actually managed to keep this 12900KS under pretty good wraps in terms of the cooling performance. Another very interesting thing that I noticed about the 12900KS is the actual memory controller stability performance. Now, usually I'm struggling to complete the benchmarks with the 4800 megahertz xmp2 enabled but this one managed to do it with no problem i think i had one crash when the room was very very hot but then when it cooled down a little bit more i seem to be completing all of the benchmarks with no problems whatsoever which is very very impressive to me now i do think that the actual ddr5 kind of stability is somehow linked uh, also to the silicon like quality because the silicon quality should be a little bit better on the 1200ks in my experience what i saw i can't say if this works with every one and all the motherboards and all the rams but this ram configuration four slot or four stick xmp i was able to run at 4800 megahertz with this system no problem so i was impressed about that just an interesting observation now i don't have too much data on this to actually give you the conclusive answer that yes it's so much better with this cpu but this is what i noticed with this cpu but generally overall is this the best bang for buck when compared to the 12900k then no, absolutely not. You're going to pay roughly about 15% more for extra few 3 to 5% increase in performance. But if you do want the best in terms of the performance, then this is the one, especially if you're a creator and you're working as a professional and the time is money then it might make a lot of sense to get the 12900ks as like a you know hobbyist or someone who just you know 
wants a very good system the 12900k is probably a better bang for buck but the best is still the 12900KS, what can I say? Overall, it's quite a bonkers CPU and quite a bonkers way to reach the top of the scales, what's the best processor, but it is the best. If you do want to check it out and pick it out, I'm going to leave the links in the description below, as well as the test setup and the build video of this. By the way, if you do want to build yourself a PC and your budget range much less than this, then I highly recommend you check out my 1000 build, $1500 build and the $2500 build. Now, the price range for these are even lower because the GPU prices have gone down and I made those videos when the GPU prices were much much higher so if you do want to save and get a killer best bang for buck deals check out the links in the description below and you'll see those videos in there you know the drill likes and subs and I'll see you soon bye bye